Michael Kasky Blomain here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline here on the Sports Bash live on 97.3 ESPN. What's up, MKB? Mike, how you guys doing? We're doing all right. Um, I, you were there last night. Uh, let's start with that. Were you in that room when Bridges was giving his uh, post-draft presser? I was, Mike. I was, uh, you know, I was one of the people that was asking him several questions about, you know, his ties to Philly, how good it felt to be drafted by his hometown team, um, you know, to be in the same organization as his mother. You know, all these questions were raining down on him, and he was, you know, it seemed genuinely happy. And toward the end of his media availability there, you know, where I'm checking Twitter and I see the initial report. I think Shams was the first one and then Woj that he had gotten traded. And I kind of looked up and started looking around the room to see if other people had, you know, noticed the same report. And eventually I felt like pretty much all the reporters were kind of looking around at each other. And, you know, me personally, I didn't want to be the one to tell him this news. And I feel like a lot of other people felt the same way. <laughs> so it kind of just played out with him thinking he was a sixer for – you know, a lot longer than the rest of us had already knew he was traded. Right, so you guys are in the room, but at was it during it, beforehand? Like, when did you know he was traded? I knew he was traded uh, about, you know, 10 minutes after he had started his media availability, which was probably about maybe 25 minutes after the initial selection was announced by Adam Silver. He was literally, like, in the middle of sitting at the podium addressing our questions when those reports started to come through on the timeline. Um, that's a tough spot for all of you guys, I guess, right? I mean, he's up there thinking he's a Sixer, wearing Sixer hat. Everybody knows he's not there, and yet you're still having to ask him questions about essentially playing for a team that he'll never never play for. At what point did he find out? Yeah, it was definitely delayed, Mike. He, he left the first media availability with us, still thinking he was a sixer. He, you know, was escorted down the hallway. There's a process they do. They get drafted. They talk to the, you know, the live reporter on TV. They go back to the media interview room, which is where we were talking to him. And then they get escorted back to, a, you know, like another private area with family and friends and agents and whatnot that the media is not allowed to go into. So he was kind of whisked from the interview room, still thinking he was a sixer, wearing the sixer's hat into this private area where he stayed for probably about 15, 20 minutes. And then he came out of that area wearing a sun's hat, and he had obviously been uh, debriefed on the situation. Michael, your initial thoughts when you heard about the trade and as it started to develop when you heard that that first-round pick was attached to it as well. Because Mike had said initially he thought it was player for player and was like, wait, what? But then that, that how key do you think that first-round draft pick was to this deal actually happening? Yeah, it's huge, Pete, because initially, you know, like a lot of people, I was pretty satisfied with the selection. I thought Bridges was a good fit on the Sixers' current roster and then obviously the Philadelphia-based background. Uh, you know, it was a feel-good story. So I was definitely somewhat surprised <clears throat> Excuse me, when I saw the, the report initially. And if it was player for player, you know, Zaire might have a higher ceiling, but as it stands right now, he doesn't project to be quite as good as a fit, at least I don't think, on this current Sixers team. So I think that, you know, once it came through that that uh, 2021 pick for Miami was not only a first-rounder but was unprotected, I think that was what really kind of swayed the trade in my mind and certainly in Brett Brett Brown's mind. You just don't get unprotected first-round picks very often in the NBA today. Teams have learned to be, you know, much much more cautious with their future draft picks. Um, So I really think that, you know, they would not have made that trade if that, you know, if that draft pick was not an option, if it was a second-round pick something like that, I do not think the trade would have gone through. But as Brett put it, you know, they got their 1B and a, a, a future first-round pick for their 1A, and, uh, you know, he felt it was a worthwhile move to pull the trigger. I was surprised where he didn't you think the 1A could have been Kevin Knox? I mean, when he said 1A and 1B and neither of those names were Kevin Knox, I was like, oh, oh okay, I see what you're doing here. You know, Pete, there was definitely some interest in Kevin Knox within the organization, and you know, I thought he was more so a 1B than Zaire. I knew that they had Bridges really high on their on their chart. I thought that, you know, he was probably their top target, which he obviously was when they passed on Michael Porter. Um, you know, that was a question that we talked about live at the draft yesterday. If Michael Porter was still on the board, whether they would pass up on him, you know, which they clearly did, and they were happy with the Bridges selection, um, as Brett said. But once that offer came through for, you know, their 1B and the additional first-round pick, that's, uh, it was just too much to tip the scale in the favor of the Zaire trade. So you believe and you're buying that timeline that they were content with Bridges when they picked him, thought, okay, this is the best pick at the time, and then Phoenix chased after them, as Brett says? 
Yeah, honestly, Pete, I do. I think, uh, you know, I, I take Brett at his word anytime he really addresses the media members. And just the way it folded, it really seems to make sense. I, I do know that they were very high on Bridges. The, uh, you know, it was mutual. He was interested in going there. They wanted him. The fit made sense, you know, a forward that could slide in between um, Ben and Joel, space the floor, get out and transition, play defense. It was all, you know, it all lined up perfectly. And I think had that offer not come down from, Phoenix, I think they would have kept uh, Bridges and been very happy with the selection. But I, I think they're just a little bit happier with getting a guy that has a you know an equally high ceiling, maybe even higher in Zaire, and obviously that additional future pick. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I tweeted out last night. If if he doesn't go to Nova and his mom doesn't work for the team, I don't think people are all that upset with the deal. It's just that everybody has kind of a local bias towards Bridges. They don't know much about Smith, but in reality, my, uh, Michael, the the, the pick is is twofold it's one you have the pick you don't know what it's going to be in 2021 but two you now have extra ammunition and brett said it last night we're star hunting that 2021 pick could be the difference in landing a Kawhi leonard or somebody else in a deal or you might just use it yourself and have it what what was this all from the beginning multiple picks in multiple drafts the optionality and if you're a good team in 2021 and have the 26 pick and Miami is just uh, an okay team and you end up getting the 12th pick, you've now won, you've won that deal. Unless, of course, Bridges turns out to be some sort of all-star. Right, which, uh, you know, he could be. It's very possible. But like you said, I think it's the optionality of that pick that was so big for Brett, who clearly learned a thing or two from Sam about, uh, you know, making deals when he was in Philly. I think, you know, that pick, it's something that, like you said, they could use this summer potentially in a deal to maybe land a Kawhi Leonard. And it's also something that's not going to decrease in value necessarily. You know, if they don't use it this summer in a trade, it's still going to be a high first-round pick next summer and even the next summer. You know, and depending on how the Heat looked at the Heat, the pick could end up looking better and better. So it's something that they just have now in their war chest, like Mike uh, alluded to, to just use to, you know, acquire a superstar talent. I think that, you know, they would have been happy with Bridges, but I think that they saw a ceiling on him. He's already, you know, obviously a 22-year-old player that has, you know, he has potential to develop into a very solid role player. Is he going to be a superstar? You know, probably not. And as, you know, like Brett said, what this team really needs to truly contend is another, you know, top-tier talent to pair alongside Ben and Joel. And, um, you know, I think he thought that this trade gave them the best opportunity to do that um, when you factor in, obviously, that first pick and the untapped potential of Zaire. Two-part question, Michael. What did you think of Brett Brown's performance as GM, if you will, or interim GM and head of basketball operations? And then, two, how about the fact that last night he revealed that at the end of the day, he was the one that had the final say in that room? Yeah, Pete, I was pretty impressed by Brett, especially, you know, with the trade. Uh, you know, I think that's a move that, you know, if he was making it as a coach, you might think that Bridges would have been a better fit in the short term as a guy that could potentially plug in this season and contribute right, right away. Um, Zaire seems to be a little bit more of a long-term project. You know, he's a little bit more raw and unpolished. And then, obviously, the foresight to have that pick. So, I think Brett, the GM, almost outweighed Brett, the coach, last night in terms of that trade, which I was kind of impressed by. I think he kept the long-term view at the forefront rather than, you know, accepting or settling for a short-term solution. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that he would probably have the final say going into last night, obviously, without an acting GM. And there's honestly not many, you know, no one not technically in the organization <clears throat> that you'd rather have making that pick. I think he has a great feel for, you know, not only what the team has, but what they need to, you know, take that next step into true contention. That's why, you know, I think that the trade definitely ruffled some feathers, like Mike said, probably just because of the Philly background of, of McCall Bridges. If it was, say, Miles Bridges that was traded, I don't think it would have been quite as, you know, disappointing to a lot of people. But I think Brett really deserves a lot of credit for making a tough move and sticking to, you know, a long-term vision and doing what he thinks is best for the team, even though it might not have been, you know, the most popular move in the city. Michael kasky Blomain is on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Of course, you can uh, check out his stuff at 97.3ESPN.com. Um, so he says we are star hunting. Does that trade now tell you and his comments last night, Michael, that they are going after Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, LeBron James. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I think, you know, that's that's their primary target. Um, those three guys, they would all fit perfectly into, you know, the, the spot that the Sixers would need there on the perimeter. 
Um, you know, as we talked about yesterday with Kawhi, I think it's really a matter of his long-term commitment. Um, they certainly have that the arsenal to make a, a very you know sound offer to the Spurs that would potentially interest them more than a lot of the other other offers from across the league. Um, you know, Paul George and LeBron obviously will be uh, in free agency, and the trade last night also helps helps them in that regard. They won't have to you know they won't have to necessarily trade Jared Bayless' salary now with the trading down from ten to sixteen save them a little bit of space on the books, whereas they could make a, you know, a smaller move to clear the necessary space with, like, say, a Justin Anderson or a TLC contract rather than having to, you know, shed the Jared Bayless contract for this year, which would be a little bit tougher. So that's a, kind of another under, underreported, I guess, aspect of the trade is a little bit of cap space that opened up for them for this summer. So I think, you know, all the everything's aligned for them to be able to go star chasing. And I think Brett knows that it's going to be difficult. Uh, you know, those three guys that you named, obviously pretty much every team in the league with the available space will want them and be after them. So that's another optionality. You know, if it doesn't happen this summer, like we said about that heat pick, it's not going anywhere. They can kind of, you know, run it back in a sense coming into this year if they miss out on these guys, mm -hmm. add some other free agents, and then, you know, head into 2019 free agency with some cap space and, you know, draft pick to use again. Do you think that Zaire Smith is in the rotation and has a role right away? And if so, does that indicate that one of the guys, Bellinelli, Urson, JJ, aren't back here? You know, Mike, I don't think they know that definitively as far as if those guys will be back. I don't think that Zaire is honestly going to have a role, at least to start the season, from what I – you know, obviously I was not at Camden last night with Brett. I was in Brooklyn. But from listening to his comments last night and this morning about Zaire, I guess the feeling is that they're really not expecting too much from him right away. I think it was a pick where they see a lot of raw and untapped potential and a guy that could really fit well into their style of play. And I think that it's kind of a luxury that they have with the team that's currently constructed that, you know, rather as opposed to the past rookies, they kind of, you know, can not rely on Zaire for as much production as they needed from, you know, Michael Carter-Williams' his first year or Ja or any of the other guys, Joel, obviously, when they first played. Um, I think they're going to bring him along really slowly, uh, maybe even spend some time down in the G League, certainly as a backup. And I think, you know, I don't think all three of those guys will be back, but having Zaire is just another, you know, another rotational piece that if he develops throughout the year, they could use. I think most interesting will be, obviously, what it uh, – you know, how it impacts Markel Fultz. Obviously, that's a, you know, Fultz was brought in to kind of be an off guard, and Zaire discussed, um, you know, playing alongside Ben Simmons as an off guard, too. So if he, uh, you know, continues to develop at a rate that he could see some minutes, I think it'll be inter interesting to see how that, uh, you know, affects Markel's playing time as well. That's a question I want to get to in a second, Michael Caskey. Well, I mean, first, I want to talk about Zaire Smith and, and hear your comments when Brett Brown says he reminds him of Kawhi Leonard. Mike Gill and I wondered if that was calculated, like, hello, Spurs, are you listening? Or was that true praise? <laughs> and then number two, uh, also, uh, maybe the potential is Andre Iguodala. I mean, are both those comparisons accurate for Zaire Smith? That's a great question, Pete. And I was wondering the same thing when uh... – you know, when uh, Zaire said that last night that Brett had compared him to Kawhi, it was uh, definitely a coincidental considering the rumors that are circulating about Kawhi coming to the Sixers. Uh, you know, that's obviously, uh, I guess, a, a comparison that Brett is making to, you know, favorable. He's not nearly at the level of Kawhi Leonard right now, but I think that Brett sees the two-way potential uh, in Zaire, a guy that really can get after it on the defensive end and out in transition and then also um, get after it on the offensive end. And Brett was obviously, you know, he was in San Antonio when they drafted or traded for Kawhi on draft night, um, you know, out of San Diego State. He was kind of an unheralded forward. And, uh, you know, Brett worked with him, obviously, those two, his first two years in the league to help him get to where he is today. And I think he sees, like, a similar potential, uh, I guess you could say, in Zaire as a guy that could be a, you know, a game changer. And I guess Andre Iguodala would be another, you know, maybe not quite as, as obviously good as Kawhi in terms of comparison, but another guy that's a two-way player that you could see the Sixers wanting Zaire to blossom into. It would just fit for, you know, Brett's preferred style of play and what he would like to see from, uh, you know, from Zaire and the team moving forward. And then Markel Fultz, uh, did his future get any clearer after last night? <laughs> uh, that's another one, Pete. I think it's actually kind of quite the opposite. You know, drafting two guards and, uh, you know, obviously Zaire Smith and uh, <clears throat> Landry um, who was obviously on with you guys earlier, two guards and obviously Fultz coming back into the, the mix, I think that does not make his role any clearer on the team, obviously depending on, you know, if J.J. comes back, maybe there's potential to, for him to slide into the starting shooting guard spot. 
But really, so much of that depends on the work that Markel's putting in right now um, over the summer, kind of away from us. Uh, you know, it's obviously been reported that he's working with Drew Hanlon, uh, and a coach that's worked with a lot of other guys like Joel and has helped them, you know, develop their game. So it, it's going to be a lot up to Markel and the work he puts in this summer to see, you know, where he fits in next year. But I think Zaire being on the roster not necessarily puts pressure on Markel, but it's certainly – uh, you know, a more more pressureful situation than it would have been if, say, they drafted a guy like Bridges that plays a completely different position rather than a guy that could, you know, potentially be ultimately competing with you for, you know, playing time. Um, you were up there last night. There were some other trades. What, what was kind of uh, some of the behind-the-scenes background stuff going on with, uh, you know, maybe the Doncic, uh, Trey Young trade? What were some of the things that stood out on, on a wild draft night? I think a lot of people were surprised by that that Trey Young trade, just by the fact that the Hawks took him so high. There was a you know definitely a buzz in the interview room that he had been drafted a lot higher than initially expected. And I think there was a lot of surprise, um, you know, amongst the people I talked to down there that there wasn't a, any actual players traded, like you know any all the trades that really went down were involving picks and, and guys coming in. When there was a lot of projections coming into the draft that there could be you know, guys on the move all the way up to Kawhi to lesser players. I think a lot of people thought there might be a little bit more action in terms of players that are already in the league rather than just trading of picks. Um, but, you know, otherwise it was definitely – it was one of those drafts, I think, that kept you on your toes a lot. There was a lot of a movement and a lot of uh, guys that dropped. Obviously, Michael Porter dropping was one. Uh, did you think – when he was on the board at 10, did you think that's who Philly was taking? You know, Mike, I didn't. I thought I really thought they were going to stick with Bridges, and I thought they were going to okay. keep Bridges. You know, I didn't see that Smith trade coming. Once, once Porter fell that far, I felt like there had to be some sort of red flag, and I knew that. You know, the Sixers are looking to compete now as, as good as Porter could be in a year or two. They're, I think, they're past the phase of you know the red shirt situation that they dealt with, and I think they were looking for someone that could kind of contribute. You know, on a quicker timeline. Interesting. All right, Michael Kasky, Blomain at the Real Mike KB. On Twitter, give him a follow there. Check out his piece uh, on Zaire Smith right now at 973ESPN.com. By the way, Landry Samet, who was on with us earlier, you know, 44% three point guy. You know, I kind of described him as a, a bigger, uh, I don't want to say TJ McConnell, but a guy that can handle the ball and give take some pressure off of Ben Simmons, but probably a better NBA three point shooter than McConnell is. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Because uh, you know, I said last night I didn't I didn't know too much about Landry after he was selected. I got to obviously meet him and talk to him last night, and I did a crash course on his game. Uh, you know, last night and this morning when I got back, looking into some of the film, and he does project to be a guy that could fit in. Like he said, he thinks he'll fit in really well with the team just because of his ability to space the floor. Um, like you said, kind of like TJ with a better shot. Uh, he thinks he'll be able to play real well off Ben and Joel with that game. So, you know, that's something obviously the team needs, a, a guard that could shoot. So there's some real potential, I think, for him if he, you know, if he puts in the work that's necessary to, you know, carve out a nice role for himself on this team. All right. Uh, he said he'll be going to Summer League. And uh, you think Fultz will be at Summer League? You know what, Mike? I don't. I think that that could still change. But I, I think that the team wants him just to put in the work on his shot throughout the summer away from the cameras and the media and to just come back uh, at training camp as close as he could. So that could change. But right now, I don't expect him to be playing at Summer League. All right. Uh, Michael Kasky, Blow Main. More on the Sixers offseason, June 29th. The uh, three agents need to decide if they're going to opt in or out. That's the LeBron James, the Chris Paul, that type of guy. And then NBA free agency on July 1. Michael, enjoy the weekend. You the man. Thanks, guys. You too. Great talking to you.